Welcome everybody. So I'm Lisa Bortolotti and I'm very pleased that uh, Lucy Pryor has joined us today. Um, so Lucy is a researcher based at the University of Birmingham, affiliated both with the philosophy department and the Institute for Mental Health. And she is funded by the M4C Doctoral Trading Partnership in her work. Um, so Lucy, um, there is this debate in the philosophy of psychiatry about whether the attention of the psychiatrist should be reserved to those behaviors and feelings that seem to be associated with uh, mental disorders, um, such as depression, or whether um, it could be also dedicated to those behaviors and feelings that are considered to be normal part of life, such as, uh, for instance, the sadness that we may feel um, if uh, a loved one has, has passed away, for instance. Uh, how do you see this debate? What, what do you think is interesting about it for you? I think it's really interesting looking at where the scope of psychiatry should lie and um, then looking at sort of what counts as a mental disorder. So just because someone is grieving in a, in a normal way, in a, what we would call a normal way, doesn't necessarily mean there's it, it there's a disorder there. I think disorder often comes with a lot of societal pressure to denormalize something and say, oh, that's that's a non non normal way of looking at it. But I think, especially for something like grief, it is normal. It's a it's a very normal response. Um, but at the same time, it can be quite debilitating. You know, there are a lot of people who suffer from, from bereavement for a very long time. And the, the question then is, if psychiatry isn't the place to deal with this and help people with their problems, where else should they go? Um, because if they, if they go to a normal doctor, the, then a normal doctor would often recommend a psychiatrist because they've, they've got the expertise, that's where to go. So it's yeah. where else would it fit really? <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, Thomas Sass was making this distinction, which I think is still alive in some uh, circles like critical psychiatry or anti-psychiatry movements between um, a mental disorder um, and a problem in living. Um, and, you know, you'd have thought that something like depression was to be considered a mental disorder, although ultimately thought that the expression mental disorder was misleading. Um, whereas the sadness that we feel um, after bereavement, for instance, would be a case of a problem in living, something that we need to face as part of life. And your work is specifically on anxiety. Um, so how do you think this distinction apply to anxiety? So it's a, that's a really good question. I think um, for anxiety, we've got um, a lot of people now, and especially young people at the moment, um, who are struggling with uh, anxiety and um, the associated feelings of anxiety. But I think one big thing is that um, a lot of a lot of people would say, "Oh, but you're you're just anxious," and it, it's not a you know you've not got a diagnosis, so you're just anxious. But that doesn't make their suffering or their incapacity to act any less important. So we should, the, the kind of idea of a disorder seems quite bounding. It means that a lot of people actually then aren't seeking out the help that they may want to seek because they're thinking, oh, but I've not got anxiety disorder. So but I still can't cope and my problems are still really strong. So I think we then need to look at, do is, is a problem in living a, in a different field? Is it less than a disorder? I don't think it is. I think we don't need the concept of disorder to recognize that the debilitating effects of anxiety on one person can't, without a, dis, without a diagnosis of a disorder, can't be the same as someone who has got uh, a diagnosis. And with anxiety in particular, it's good to recognize there's the normal emotion anxiety that everybody feels, like with grief, that people get anxious all the time. And I think nowadays uh, with this, there's a lot of medicalization that goes on, which 
um, that's quite quite linked to the anti-psychiatry movement is this kind of move against medicalization. Um, Peter Comrade, he's really, really great and he does a lot of work on medicalization. He says, you know, we're, we're over medicalizing things now. And I think with anxiety, that's a big thing. A lot of people at the moment are saying, oh, um, you're anxious, therefore you have some disorder, but it's not. We need to recognize that anxiety is a, part, a normal part of life, especially now with the coronavirus. It's people are going to be more anxious than they already are. And the, how we diagnose disorders is based on social norms anyway. The DSM-5 is based on social norms it's how anxious are you and do you think that's out of the ordinary for you yeah and at the moment the ordinary is very much not ordinary so yeah so if we if we just follow the literature um what could be a good example of of a state of anxiety this uh, is considered to be normal and a state of anxiety that triggers a diagnosis of anxiety disorder. What would be the key differences, at least on paper, uh, that one could uh, spot there? So um, according to things like uh, the Diagnostic Standards Manual, um, the most recent one anyway, it seems to be frequency and intensity. Okay. So if you're you know, getting anxious almost every day or very frequently in a week over the space of, I think they're around six weeks or more. So it is quite an, a, quite a long duration. Then there would be a move to um, make a diagnosis rather than just say, oh, you're, um, you know, you're just a bit anxious. And I think as well, um, people's capacity to act and how debilitating you find it. So say you get anxious quite frequently, but you're still manage to, managing to live your life quite normally and it's not really getting in your way. Do you recognize it? Oh, I'm a bit anxious today, but then you're continuing your day as per normal. Yeah. Um, that wouldn't be sort of enough to justify a, a diagnosis. That's really helpful. Thank you, Lucy. So you are particularly interested in anxiety in young people yeah. and, uh, I guess one question would be, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of medicalizing or pathologizing anxiety in this particular group? So I'll start with the advantages. Um, I think one big thing is for young people, it really does kind of legitimize their struggles. When you say, hey, what, what's happening to you is not normal. And in the sense that you shouldn't have to always live like this. And there are ways in which we can help you em employ coping strategies and mechanisms that will help you, you know, navigate your life. I think that's so beneficial to a lot of young people. And it really gives them a sense of, oh, actually, you know, it's not just me. Yeah. Uh, especially that idea of for young people um, in particular who don't a lot of the time we see in young people they think that everybody else is normal so they think oh nobody else struggles with this and this is just a me thing therefore there's something you know really wrong with me now, actually when we when we use these disorder terms and we say actually what's happening to you is you've got generalized anxiety disorder then these a lot of young people think oh okay now it's manageable I've got a name for it I can apply things but um I do think there are some disadvantages which is what I'm working on at the moment and one of them being this kind of um sort of adoption of the label so they get a label and they say oh generalized anxiety disorder that's what I have and they kind of take it on as a possession and they start identifying with it, which means that this could, this is now hypothetical, but I believe that this could then potentially inhibit them from um, trying to improve, well, get, get better in, in the medicalized terms, but trying to deal through the struggles they're going with because of this uh, label they're identifying with. Um, and there's growing literature about um, the identification with uh, labels and 
and that sort of stuff. And I think it could have a detrimental impact on their agency, which I think is really important that we consider when we look at diagnosis, especially of young people who are more susceptible to um, this kind of thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely interesting. So when you, when you say that being diagnosed with, with a disorder could, be, uh, could have effects on, on young people's agency, what do you have in mind? I mean, is it the idea that they may, in some sense, um, self-stigmatize? So assume that they, um, their behavior can be associated with negative features that are normally associated with the diagnosis that they attract? Is it something like that? Or do you have something else in mind? Um, slightly something else, but it is related. Um, it's the idea of holding oneself back because they believe that something is wrong with them. So because it's, it, it's externalized in this way, you have this, this problem and then it's applied to them, they then may experience their life as, oh, I can't do something because I have X disorder, social anxiety disorder. So instead of then, when if a you know event comes up, like a party or something, instead of going through steps like, oh, you know, a, a normal, normal, you know, non-diagnosed people would also go through these, like, I'm a bit anxious before the party, you know, what can I do to deal with this uh, anxious experience? In young people with, who have been diagnosed with social anxiety disorder, a lot of times they say, oh, I can't go to the party because I have social anxiety disorder. And it it's kind of a, a limiter on what they are then able to do and what they what more so what they believe they're able to do mm. um but i at the moment i think a lot more work needs to be done into um the effects on this agency which is what i'm hoping to do at the moment but we we'll see where it goes <laughs> yes that's fantastic thank you very much lucy for your time we thank really you. enjoyed hearing from you and uh, good luck with your research thanks so well. much thank you